Thank you. Well, I'm very happy to be here uh, today. And uh, actually, I was a postdoc in Tel Aviv in 95 to 97, something like that. And it was really a very, really very interesting, very formative time. And I, I enjoyed my stay there a lot. And uh, well, I, I wanted, I had one memory of Yakir, which uh, is, I don't know if it's the same, some thing with other people, the same with other people, but when I would meet him in the corridor or something, he would ask me, what's new? And then I would, you know, tell him, well, when I would meet Yakir in the corridor, he would ask me what's new. And then I would tell him, you know, what I was thinking about uh, my, my latest thoughts or uh, results and if it interested him he would invite me to play a game of chess so he would invite me to that's better so he would invite me to play a game of chess and the first time I actually won and then he said oh let's play another game and uh, he paid attention and I never won any other game with him <laughs> but so that was my yardstick to understand if what I had done was interesting yaki or not was whether I could play chess with him Anyway, it was a great time, very interesting, and I would really like to thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me the opportunity of hearing all these great talks and meeting uh, a lot of old friends and also people which I knew their work but never met. And so, well, I'll be giving a talk which is very even more outside of the, the central theme of the, uh, the conference. Uh, because I haven't been doing much work on more foundation, uh, foundation of quantum mechanics questions for a long time. And so I'll be talking about what I've been doing for the past uh, 10 years, which is really all even uh, mainly classical, uh, well, only classical physics. I've got a long series of topics to cover. So i uh, talk a little bit about AI and machine learning, about the kind of algorithms we try to implement and uh, a connection to how the brain works. Uh, there's the brain doing the same kind of things we've been trying to do in implementing optical systems. Then I'll detail some results. I'll have one slide at the end on quantum machine learning. There were some discussions about this during the conference, so maybe that'll be interesting. And uh, I'll conclude. So machine learning is really is trying to learn from examples. This is a famous database of uh, handwritten numbers and you need to try to find a, a mechanism to recognize, given some examples, being able afterwards to recognize uh, what handwritten number you were proposed. So uh, you would have some outputs and you would try to select the correct output given uh, that the, the left is, seems to be a two. And uh, so, there's been many, many works in this direction over the past uh, decades. And about uh, 10 years ago, there was this breakthrough where suddenly the performance started to increase dramatically on really hard tasks. So not recognizing simple handwritten digits, but recognizing uh, much more complicated images. And this has uh, you know, ballooned into what is probably, what, well, certainly one of the more, uh, one of, is going to be one of the most disruptive technologies of the 21st century is uh, AI. So, uh, the, so the brain, brain, just to introduce a bit further what I'm trying to do, well, of course, you know, our human brain is doing machine learning tasks all the time. We've learned from examples or, and uh, then we are, we're doing this, so how, does it compare how the brain and the digital computer uh, compare? They, they actually operate in completely different ways. So the, they com can consume approximately the same amount of power, but a digital computer like the ones on your desktop operate at about a gigahertz, whereas our brain is sort of unit of time for operating is about at a rate of a kilohertz. Digital computers are really sequential. They're doing operations one after the other. Whereas our brain is massively parallel, it has a huge number of neurons, and each neuron is connected to, uh, well, 10,000, say, synapses through 10,000 other neurons, and everything is happening in parallel at approximately a rate of a, a millisecond or something like that. And so a natural question which people have been asking for a long time is, can we make hardware which computes a bit like the brain? And they, this is, uh, there are at least, uh, well, 
uh, several motivations. One of them is that uh, these artificial neural networks, which have been so successful, actually, they're sort of implementing digitally an analog computation. So could one gain some efficiency or make something better by doing the computations more in the analog domain directly than in the digital domain? And also, can one learn new insights about machine learning, about artificial intelligence, about how the brain is working in these uh, approaches? Now, the, most of the work, or the most, by far the most impressive work in this direction, is using electronics. And, but well, I'll be talking about how, what things you can do with optics in this direction. And just to compare, uh, electronics is a very mature technology. Optics is improving, but if you compare what you can do, it lags probably by several decades behind electronics. At a more fundamental level, electronics has a very low footprint. That is, you know, the, the size of the wires you can make is, say, 10 nanometers, whereas in optics, you're limited by the wavelength of light, which is about a micrometer. So you're, you're always be making things much larger. Uh, optics also has very weak nonlinearities, which make it difficult to do nonlinear operations. On the other hand, well, electronics may have some speed limitations, and intrinsically, it's difficult to do things in parallel in optics and using the same hardware. Whereas in optics, because light doesn't talk to each other, the weak nonlinearities, you can do uh, the same thing at the same place with different light beams, and potentially optics can be much faster. And it could have some applications. Certainly, given all these limitations, but it could have some applications in places where you want to process information directly in the, tele in the optical domain, for instance, for uh, telecommunication applications. Uh, up to trying to do computation or information processing with optics today is very prehistoric. It's a bit like trying to imagine how uh, the first organisms which uh, were trying to uh, coordinate uh, sensors and movement were in the Precambrian or something like that. Uh, really, probably extremely primitive. And because of all these limitations, there's, we're nowhere near to have ever made a, something like a digital optical computer. So, uh, well, the next, so after this, uh, well, what kind of machine learning algorithms can we try to implement with these very primitive systems? And so this is what I want to discuss now, is uh, some the two algorithms which are very simple and can, you can do with, uh, without too much, too sophisticated hardware and too fine control over it. For comparison, these are the example of uh, these deep neural networks where we have uh, an input sent through a, a sequence of neurons and you're going to, to get these very impressive performances. You train, you optimize all the connections in this network. And this is uh, well, very, very powerful, but very difficult to implement once you start to have physical analog systems, because there's too many parameters, and they need to be controlled too finely. So one uh, much more simple architecture is just to have a single layer in the middle. This goes by the somewhat pompous name of extreme learning machine. But basically, you've got an input which you send to many, many internal variables. And then you collect the state of these internal variables. There's been some nonlinear processing here in the output. And you only train these weights. So if I go back to my example of handwritten digits, you would try to train these weights so the output would be high if the input corresponded to, say, the digit 2 and low in the other cases. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is the, uh, you have chosen random weights here, and so this has been studied uh, theoretically, but because the weights are random, this means that if you wanted to implement it in an experimental system, you could actually probably deal with all sorts of particular constraints from your experimental system, because uh, if random weights work, if random connections work, then it means that most connections should work. And because you only train the output weights, the training is easy to do. And because there's no uh, effect of training some weights on what the others will do. If you compare with this problem, if you change a weight here, it's going to change all the future operations. And so it's very complicated, much more complicated to optimize this whole network compared to only optimizing the final layer. 
And uh, this actually, as I'll show in a few seconds, in a few minutes, will be, uh, is quite similar, seems quite similar to a structure we have in the brain. Uh, so before going to that, I'll talk about another algorithm we'll be studying, which is, again, an algorithm with some fixed uh, random weights. But now it's a system which processes time-dependent information. So the input is a time series, say, uh, some recording of uh, some movement and or some speech signal. And it's perturbing this dynamical system consisting of many uh, internal variables. And so the system is responding to this, say, speech signal in a deterministic way, but a very complicated way. And then you create an output by optimizing. You take a linear combination of the states, of internal states of the system to produce your output. And this kind of system can uh, process time-dependent information. Again, it has, uh, if you think of in, uh, practical or physical implementations, uh, we're going to be, well, OK, it, it's processing time-dependent si signals because it's got this recurrent dynamics. It's got some memory of the past, so it's good for uh, processing such series. And because the internal weights are fixed and you can generally choose them uh, randomly, you can hope that in a physical implementation, uh, you can find uh, configurations which should work and com do comparable to digital systems. And because you're only, again, training the output weights, you get uh, much easy training of the system. So as I said, this, some of these algorithms seem similar to what, how the brain, at least one organ in the brain, the cerebellum, processes information. It's an, a little organ you have at the back of your brain. And uh, so it's here this, uh, uh, in this uh, zone here. And this organ is involved, for instance, in visual motor coordination. So you can damage the cerebellum. It's not lethal, but it'll change, make it much more difficult, basically impossible to do a movement like this, put your finger on your nose smoothly, because there's a very complicated coordination between your movement and what your, your eyes are seeing. And basically, the cerebellum gets impaired if you drink alcohol. So uh, the problems you have when you drink alcohol are typical of uh, tell you or telling you more or less what the cerebellum does. It's a structure which is very conserved in evolution. For instance, uh, uh, birds have a similar structure. Even insects have a structure which is probably coming from parallel evolution, which uh, it's called the mushroom body and has a very similar structure. And it's a very special structure in the brain because it, it's smallish, but it contains the majority of the neurons in the brain. So how does this, what does this cerebellum look like? Well, it's got a series, the main, most important neurons uh, are depicted here, whether well, just two kinds, there are many other additional ones, but you've got information which comes in and to, that connects to what these are called these granule cells, these very small cells these are the ones with the most numerous neurons in the brain, which just have something like three or four inputs. And then they have one output fiber, which goes into this zone where it, it splits and it becomes one long parallel fiber. And so you've got inputs coming in, being connected to all these neurons here, and each of them sends one output fiber. And then perpendicular to all these fibers are these readout uh, neurons, Depicted here, this is a sort of transverse picture of this Nurinda neuron, which connects to something like 500,000 of these fibers. And this readout neuron has one extra input, which is a signal telling it, oh, I would like you to try to see if there's, something, if there's a correlation between the signal I'm sending you and anything else you're sensing here. So it's... Uh, trying to establish correlations between things which have been coming in here and its special input telling it what it should look at. As a uh, numbers, well, there's something like uh, in a human cerebellum, 200 million inputs, which get connected to something like 50 billion of these very small granule cells, which then send out these parallel fibers. And these are connected there are many different regions in the cerebellum doing different things to these output cells called Purkinje cells. And so you have a, some, for 10 inputs, you've got 5,000 of these parallel fibers and then one output. And this seems 
quite similar to this kind of structure where you've got an input spread out to a very large high dimensional intermediate layer and then you try to train your outputs. And it may be that in this structure there's also some uh, additional information, there could be some additional information processing loops which are recurrent, uh, taking into account time dependence, in which case it, would also, it could be for similar in some way to this, but that is not really uh, known if this is actually the case. So now let me go to the, uh, the core part of uh, uh, what I wanted to talk to you about is some experiments we've done on implementing these machine learning algorithms in optics. And I'll first talk about how to implement this reservoir computing algorithm with delay dynamical systems and then on using uh, these extreme learning machines or reservoir computing with frequency combs. So uh, uh, how our neurons there will be the different frequencies of light. So if we want to implement this kind of reservoir computing, we need some dynamical system which has some complicated dynamics which we can perturb and then read out the internal states. So high dimensional dynamical system, some nonlinear but deterministic mapping of the time dependent input to the internal states. And uh, we can, should be able to tune the strengths of these connections so that the system is in the right dynamical regime. So there have been many trials. The first one back in 2003 just used wa excited waves on the surface of water and filmed them with a camera and showed that this could in principle work. The system we developed, uh, the first system we developed in was based on uh, what are called nonlinear uh, delay dynamical systems where you've got a nonlinear node and then this is the information coming from this node is fed back into the, your nonlinear system with a delay and you can adjust the strength of the feedback. These are well studied systems in nonlinear dynamics. A very good example is when you take your shower in a, in a hotel or something and you try to adjust the temperature and the, there's a delay between when you turn the tap and how long it takes before you get the change in temperature of the water which is falling on your head. And uh, then you react, but in a nonlinear way, and suddenly it's, the temperature is burning, and then it's much too cold. And you can see that you can get complicated oscillations, complicated dynamics in these systems. And uh, this is, a, 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 well, uh, it's been studied quite a lot. This is a picture taken from an old experiment where you change the strength of the feedback in the system, and you go from a, a deterministic behavior and then the system starts oscillating if the feedback is too strong, becomes strong enough, and then it becomes completely chaotic. Um, so these systems have a rich dynamics and we're going to operate them someplace here where their response to a perturbation will be strong and complex, but the system doesn't have autonomous dynamics. So how do we do this if we want to process information in such a system? Well, we're going to sort of view the loop as containing all along different in nodes which contain information which are our kind of neurons between quotes and we're going to send information in and then read out the information going around this loop. There are a number of details on exactly how you should do this for this to work and I don't have the time to get into this but it's a, a, a nice system to get into this topic because it actually is quite economical in terms of resources you just need one nonlinear node and then everything is encoded in your delay loop. And on the other hand, it is inherently slow in this because you're going to process each neuron, each node one after the other. So there's a kind of, if you wanted uh, 10,000, 1,000 nodes here, you would be processing them uh, one after the other and you'd have a slowdown by a factor 1,000. And uh, uh, this is a schematic of an experimental system we implemented uh, doing this with uh, this is our nonlinearity and then the light goes here. The neurons are, uh, stay in this uh, fiber spool, maybe I don't know, 10 kilometers of fiber are detected and uh, we add here whatever input signal we want to process in the electronic domain and this controls how much intensity of light goes through the system. This is a photograph of part of the system. An example of the kind of things you can do with this, which we, we published just very recently, is recognizing human actions in videos. So these videos were pre-processed and then analyzed by this system. And you had, this is a 
well-known database for this where people are doing different actions, walking, jogging, running, clapping their hands, and you have to try to recognize what action they're doing. Uh, so our, we got something like 95% say accuracy on this problem. If you use uh, you know, the state of the art today basically on this database you can do it perfectly, but the system is rather simple, only 600 variables and quite fast. So now in the, the next part I'll talk about another set of experiments where we're going to try to exploit the, the coherence of light and the parallelism offered by light. So considering coherence, we're basically going to process our information in a, some kind of linear interferometer and then we're going to read out the intensity at the output of this interferometer and this is going to provide us with the nonlinearities we want because the intensity is going to be the norm squared of the amplitudes and this norm squared is the, uh, it provides us with interesting nonlinearity. There's been like theoretical studies of this where for instance you have a, a time dependent input driving a recurrent linear system like this and then your output is a polynomial in these internal variables with uh, trained coefficients. And this works quite well. And so basically with light, what we're going to do, we're going to measure the intensity, so our polynomial is going to be second degree only. Uh, so this has been uh, implemented already almost 10 years ago. What we've been doing recently is implementing this, but not using spatial degrees of freedom, but using the frequencies of light. So our optical fields, we are uh, a sum over k of e to the i small omega is just the carrier frequency and then there are shifts by big omega times k and the ak's are the amplitudes of our neurons between quotes of our information carrying systems. So if you look at a spectrum, here is wavelength and you'd have this Coombe structure with uh, a light at different wavelengths and the amplitudes or the intensities of these uh, waves are what carries information for us. We can manipulate this in the frequency domain by driving a phase modulator with a radio frequency signal. So that means that our a plane wave, a monochromatic wave, gets a phase which is e to the i m cosine omega t. I change the phase but with a, a sinusoidal function. And this, if you do the Fourier transform, well you get a sum over all these uh, Coombe lines separated by omega with some coefficients which are related to Bessel functions. And this allows us to create the, comb, comb, the combs and to uh, manipulate, mix the light in between different comb lines. So a simple, uh, an example of how we use this, we have a laser, monochromatic laser, uh, as you here is uh, one frequency, we create a comb uh, out of this, then we're going to encode our input, the data we want to analyze by attenuating the different spectral lines with some filter. So then we have our encoded information. We mix the different um, lines with another phase modulator and then we can analyze the output and we can uh, selectively well, decide well, which comb line should have positive weights at the output, which should have negative weights. We, put, uh, we put send the positive weights to one photodiode, the negative weighted comb lines to the other photodiode and take the difference to have something which has both positive and negative weights. Well, we don't have many comb lines. Uh, this, this spectrum here uh, gives us something like uh, 20, 25 comb lines. So we can't do very complicated data processing with this. These are some examples comparing what we get in different configurations of the system uh, in say accuracy of training. This iris classification is one of the, is the oldest kind of data set in this area, which was created by Fisher in about 100 years ago when he wanted to uh, do some statistical inference about data. Um, so that's an, one example. What we've recently done is replace this phase modulator by some nonlinearities in the optical fibers with uh, amplifying the fiber and then sending it through an optical fiber. And what was surpri surprised us and we now confirmed with experimental simulations is actually we need very little nonlinearity and a very little mixing between these comb lines to have something interesting happening. And so here is as a function of propagation distance in the uh, amplifier. 
The amplifier is not very long, 20 meters, and this is the integrated nonlinearity in which is like a, measured by an angle in milliradian. So it's not very, it's very small nonlinearity. And we see here the performance on uh, one of these tasks, which gets better and better, and then basically saturates. There's no more improvement when you make things more nonlinear. So in this, we, we can improve things, but only using very little nonlinearity, which is interesting for any, uh, uh, from a technological point of view, because as I, I mentioned, optical nonlinearities are uh, weak, and so if you can do with small nonlinearities, you're certainly uh, helping yourself. We also uh, did study, implemented with the same system, some time-dependent information processing. So the kind of scheme we have is we have our laser, we modulate in time its intensity. So we have uh, our uh, monochromatic laser whose intensity is, or amplitude is going to change in time. We create a, f a frequency comb with this. And then we send this into a loop where each round trip, it's going to get new information coming in. And in the loop, there's also a phase modulator which mixes the information. So we're going to have a comb in the loop which changes at each round trip. And then we collect, well, we need to amplify a bit the light in the comb. We collect the output, put weights on the different comb lines, and measure the intensity. So we'll, in this comb, we'll, for instance, select one a uh, comb line, and this comb line will be changing in time. Another comb line will be changing in time in a different way, and we take a linear combination of these comb line intensities to create the output we want. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, well, these are some examples of results on, again, some rather simple task. This is a, a channel equalization task where we need to correct errors, distortions, and data, and some artificial data transmitted through a channel, and, uh, well, our results correspond well to simulations and to uh, different ways of processing the data. This is predicting the future or the past of a time series, and you want to see with how much error you can predict the future or the past of the time series. And so these are the, the different time shifts in the future. The past is just remembering what was happening. And uh, again, the system performs reason quite reasonably given the few uh, optical lines, we, well, the, the small size of the comb. Uh, very recently, we've been trying to combine two of these reservoirs, one behind the other, so that we can have more complex information processing and also optimize in some way the connection between the two reservoirs. And we can do this with uh, basically the same system. We've got one laser which creates a first comb, which is the first reservoir, and then this one is read out and used to control uh, a second laser at a different frequency, which implements the second reservoir of everything propagating in the same optical components. So these are um, these different experimental systems which are exploring, as I was saying, very baby machine learning tasks with uh, the kind of technologies which you can use in implement in optics nowadays. There are many different uh, groups exploring this and trying different approaches. I have uh, basically to end one slide on uh, quantum machine learning. What would happen if we tried to implement these ideas with, uh, uh, in a quantum <laughs> computer? And uh, with a quantum system, uh, there are certainly problems which appear. Uh, well, if you had, imagine that our uh, machine learning system is composed of n qubits. So the Hilbert space dimension is uh, 2 to the n. but uh, we only have something like order n parameters we can train to try to optimize this system and make it learn better. And then we, we run into two problems, which uh, at least uh, prepare, uh, well, uh, the two naive problems you encounter. One is that the outputs, when you try to measure how your system is performing, are stochastic because it's a quantum system. You measure, you get random results. So if suppose you measure all these qubits, well, you're going to get random results, and maybe you're going to need actually of order 2 to the n measurements to get uh, good uh, statistics on what's happening in the system. So there you could have uh, a tremendous inefficiency. And the other inefficiency which you can have is that there's uh, something called, which is called the barren plateau, which is that if you, you have your, your performance of your system, this is very good, say, this is very bad, and uh, suppose you're someplace in the middle, well, you've got your, your Hilbert space has dimension 2 to the n, so there are 2 to the n directions you can go here. 
but there's only one which is improving performance and one which is making things bad. And if you change one of these parameters, well, it's going to most likely be going in the flat direction. So you, it's very difficult, naively, to find how to uh, optimize internal parameters so that you're going to improve performance. Now, I've not, uh, I'm sure that if there are experts, uh, they'll tell you that there are plenty of uh, approaches which have been tried to solve this, but uh, still it shows that uh, naively saying we're going to take machine learning and just make it quantum isn't uh, obvious or easy, and uh, saying uh, what is, uh, like people were talking about, what would be a quantum brain, it's not obvious uh, what this would do and uh, whether it would actually perform better or worse than a classical brain. I think it's sort of a generic problem of, uh, you can think of it as a generic problem of quantum algorithms. But in general, if you got some, but here it's, the, the problem here in machine learning is that you want to, uh, you want to try to learn from your examples how to improve performance. And so if you're far from uh, good performance, then, more, then most likely you're, you're, when you try a change, this change will not have any effect. But I think it's something which sort of shows the difficulties of building quantum algorithms in general. Because you have to, so there may be clever ways of circumventing this, but then you have to find an architecture where uh, you can try directions and you know they most likely would have an effect. So uh, just to end on the perspectives for our work, there are many technical improvements we can do to have uh, better performance, higher speed, maybe address issues about energy consumption, address, uh, try to make things more in integrated optics, so put everything on chips. Also, of course, I think very interesting is try to improve or try other algorithms. And uh, just, uh, well, to, to end, uh, so uh, deep neural networks trained with error back propagation, sort of the standard in the field of AI is, may not be the only useful algorithm. It's pretty clear it's not that way that the brain works and trains. Uh, it has some appeal to try to make implementations of these algorithms in uh, analog systems because you avoid doing a digital computation where you could do an analog one. And, but then how do you leverage the, 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 how, what your physical systems can do? And then I gave some examples. And yeah, uh, quantum machine learning certainly has many interesting questions and many problems. And okay, this is a list of some of the people who helped me, uh, who helped us, who worked on these problems. And I want to especially thank my colleague, Marc Alderman, who, with whom I started all this project. Thank you. In this diagram, yeah. uh, so beta here, if you see on the, there's some, uh, this system had this specific equation of evolution where you have uh, the current state of x is being updated, so it's uh, continue, uh, it's tau x dot plus x, and then the right hand side is some nonlinear function of x at delay time t, and beta is reflecting the strength of the feedback, that's going to be the horizontal axis. And lambda is some variable, I don't know, corresponding to x probably, or x squared, something like that. So in that case, is there any meaning for a, a complete x, an interpretation of the Feigenbaum constant? I don't know. Okay. Uh, yes, Avi? Uh, so, 
Actually, the choice of light was because I was uh, in a working and doing experiments in an optics lab when I started getting interested in this. So I did things with what I had under the hand. You could certainly do a lot of this with radio waves. I don't think people have uh, really tried this, but one could uh, yeah, do this with radio waves. And then you can try with electronics. And then there's a whole area which I basically don't understand about trying to do some analog uh, machine learning with electronics using. Yeah, so you could do a lot. You, I think you could do everything, probably, and then adapt to the specificity, specificities of radio waves. Yeah, certainly. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know. I, frankly, the, the most impressive optical information processing systems like this, which I know, are like bulk optics, which use uh, spatial light modulators to encode the information, maybe some white paint to diffract it, uh, an array of photo uh, uh, CCD camera to detect this. And there you can already get pretty impressive performance, which you, you can easily argue that this is doing, uh, you're doing much better than what you could do with electronics. Yeah. Um, I, so this is a, a, not the direction I've been pursuing. Uh, so there is certainly things you can do to scale up to some extent. Afterwards, I don't know. Uh, and it, yeah. I don't have a good answer. You can do an integrated optics, but optics, uh, so you can do integrated optics, but that is still, uh, uh, well, so probably if you really, if optics was to be a solution, you should go to 3D because integrated optics today is two dimensional and optics has what I said at the beginning. It has this uh, scale problem that the wavelength of light is about a micrometer. And so this limits how much you can components or things you can put on, say, a one centimeter squared optical chip compared to what you could put with electronics on a one centimeter squared. If you can start to do things in three dimensions, then you could gain uh, compared to electronics if you can exploit this. So it's a very good question, and I don't think anybody has an answer. Uh, and we also don't know about the human brain, what part of it is just how, maybe part of the scale of the human, of the brain is because it's working using some, you know, this soft technology uh, we have in the, in the uh, biological technology and that using other technologies, you could scale things down by several orders of magnitude and have the same performance. Maybe, maybe not. This is very difficult to know. possibility of, of hybrid options in the sense that, you know, you, as you mentioned, there are some things that the um, uh, normal electronic computer could do very, very rapidly. And if there's a way of doing it so that you would have uh, part of your processing happens in the optical, then eventually you read out in the detector, the detector readout goes into the computer to sort of complete the calculation. You know, there are some things that the normal uh, machine learning on computers does better, and other things that maybe the optical system does better, there's a way to combine them in some clever way. So I, well, in the systems we're doing, we often cheat and do uh, part of the information processing uh, electronically. So if I go to this uh, scheme, the FPGA there is basically a computer uh, helping us along the way. If I go back to this experiments I was talking about, which use these bulk uh, volume optics, which are uh, like use a million pixels or something like that. There, what I heard recently is that they've, they've brought their system next to a supercomputer as a, a sort of, could we use this as an add-on to help for some computations? So 
it's obviously a very good uh, question and maybe that could be where this is useful. Well, the, so this is, so there's the electronic interface you have in, uh, yeah. so in these systems, for instance, uh, let me go to, to this one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've got our radio frequency to generate our frequency combs. We've got an arbitrary waveform generator to generate our inputs. Uh, well. It seems to be that uh, limitation of the yeah. It may be, for instance, people have been looking at applications of these kind of systems, maybe not with this architecture, to uh, processing like telecom signals. And then your input is already in the optical domain. Yeah. And you want, so the AWG there is replaced by what is coming through your optical fiber as input. It's already optical and you want to do some processing of the signal in the optical domain rather than what is done nowadays, converting everything to digital electronics and then processing it in the electronic domain. Yeah. Then the refinery to the limitation by the digital, uh, uh, just uh, only the another, uh, digital uh, electronics only. So there, yeah, so there you would get rid, you could try to get rid of some digital electronics for some applications where this is what is used now and maybe you could do, uh, for instance, for channel equalization or some decoder or encoder in optical communication. Uh, yeah, frankly, I, one thing which I think is interesting from my point of view, I try to think more about the concepts of these things. I'm not really, I'm not an engineer and I know I don't think like an engineer, which is the question you're asking. So for instance, the kind of questions which interest me at the moment is more, well, if I have several of these systems, can I combine them in a way to do, uh, to make something more powerful? Uh, in a bit the same way that you have these deep uh, learning systems. Uh, yeah, how can we boost the performance of these systems? And how does that scale with the size or the number? And what is the good way to do that? Because that's a very open question. Okay, thank you. So there, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, let's take Serge.